So good morning, folks. Um, I, I hope you've enjoyed Paul's intro. You, you did a really good job recapping um, <laughs> recapping the day yesterday. I think we had a really good day. Uh, but it's time to kind of get a little bit more hands-on today. Uh, so hopefully we can kind of learn how to do things in practice. Uh, and uh, to get us started, we're going to be walking through what is a reasonably basic setup of a um, from scratch, this is like nothing up my sleeve. So from scratch setup of um, the GitOps, uh, GitOps pipeline on Kubernetes. Uh, and this is really from scratch. We, we, we should be able to do this from just a browser. If you have a, a, um, a terminal that might help you on your local machine, but you don't even need that. Uh, what you will need is to get hold of um, DigitalOcean uh, login uh, to, uh, to actually uh, run through the tutorial. So let me uh, try and figure out where I can share my screen and then we can get started. Brilliant. All right, so getting started with GitOps. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure that the slides are available to you. Um, so that they'll be available to use to copy, use, and abuse, and share inside your company as well if you want. Um, as it says here, I, I, I'm from WeWorks. Um, I work uh, essentially with our customers I, I, on the engineering side uh, with our customers. So I don't build the products, I don't build Flux, but uh, I work with customers to build their platform. Uh, so the things we're going to be talking about today are really the kind of things we'd be doing for a customer or with a customer, uh, and we'd be taking it much further But uh, uh, when we work with our clients. So the plan for today is, and, and this is a plan, but uh, all plans will, will eventually uh, not go particularly well. So we'll see how, how it goes today. But we'll set up a de GitOps de deployment pipeline um, from scratch. Uh, we'll deploy an application. We'll expose our application so we have a public endpoint for application. And we'll release a new version of our application. That, that's the plan for today. Maybe we'll do progressive deployments. Maybe we'll do a canary release. This is a, if we have plenty of time. Um, but it's, uh, it would be a bonus if we get to that point. So if you want to follow along, you'll need your browser, you'll need a GitHub account, you'll need a DigitalOcean account, and maybe an SSH client. Um, you don't have to. Don't feel compelled. Don't switch off. Uh, hopefully, uh, it'll be interesting and useful, even if you're not following along. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, after this uh, conference, you you get a, in the email, you'll, you'll have a link so that you can walk through this tutorial yourself. All the information will be available to you after this uh, after this conference, so you can do this on your own. Uh, so if you want to kind of just relax, kick back, and get a nice drink, uh, please feel free. Um, but otherwise, if you want to follow along, you'll need those things up and running. Uh, and, and this is really uh, going to be a from scratch uh, setup. So we're going to be building the development machine uh, that, and then building the environment, um, and then building the actual putting the application together on top of that. Uh, we're not going to write the application code. Uh, Stefan, who, who's um, a contributor, and you, you, you will have known Stefan if you're part of this conference. Um, Stefan built um, PodInfo, so we're going to reuse this PodInfo uh, from him. OK, so I'm just going to do a quick recap of GitOps itself. Um, I think this is important just in case you're joining us today. Um, I think Paul did a really good job of overviewing yesterday, but uh, I just want to focus on GitOps itself. It should take us maybe 10 minutes. Uh, we've, we've got plenty of time today. So uh, we'll do a quick recap of GitOps, uh, and then we'll, we'll get started with actually building our environment. So um, we've talked about how what GitOps is. It's an operational model. Um, it's how you operate. It's derived from computer science and operational knowledge, uh, things like control theory, um, et cetera. It's technology agnostic. We, we talk a lot about Git, and we talk a lot about specific technology, but really, as Cordelia said, and, and as I'll reiterate here, it's really about a set of principles. Um, it's why instead of how. How is you know something that we can help with, that a lot of vendors can help with, that you can build yourself, but it's really about the why. Um, and the core value is, is really velocity, right? That's, that's the core value. And, and Paul um, made that point very elo eloquently uh, yesterday and today. So we talk about the GitOps model. And we're going to be working with Kubernetes. Now, this is a GitOps conference, not a Kubernetes conference. So I don't necessarily expect you to use Kubernetes or be very familiar with it. But you can replace Kubernetes by whatever environment you're currently managing. Uh, we're going to be using Kubernetes because it's nice and easy to get started. And it has a bunch of nice feature around GitOps. But it is not necessarily uh, the only environment that can be controlled with GitOps. 
And typically what you used to have is kubectl direct access, right? You'd have a direct access into your environment. And uh, I think Cornelia said yesterday that uh, kubectl is the SSH of cloud native. And I think she's absolutely right, right? It's an anti-pattern to use SSH to manage an environment if you're a sysadmin. Uh, it's an anti-pattern to manage a Kubernetes cluster with kubectl if you're a, an operator of a Kubernetes cluster. Those are anti-patterns. So, so we make those, we, we remove those patterns altogether. So from now on, we'll be using a configuration repository, uh, using a deployment agent, um, and, and as mentioned previously, and as I'll explain in, in some detail here, the deployment agent living inside the security boundary makes a big difference. Uh, we're actually putting the deployment agent on the cluster itself, not in the CI environment, not in the PR, uh, the, the verification software that runs on a PR. All of that, actually, the actual deployment agent uh, and the keys are actually running in the cluster. And we'll, we'll have an image repository, but uh, that's par for the course when working with Kubernetes. And really what's really important here is this control loop. It's the fact that we're actually uh, iterating and uh, converging towards a good state, the desired state. Uh, so if you imagine, uh, and, and I'll, I, I, I will talk to the engineers amongst us, if you imagine a PID controller, um, essentially what you'll have is a damped oscillator, right? So it's like it starts off wild and then you're slowly converging towards uh, a narrow point, which is your desired value. Well, it's very much the same about uh, control with GitOps. We're building control loops. Uh, and note that there are many control loops in your environment. I like to think of these nested um, control loops. Um, there are control loops in the Kubernetes cluster with the controllers themselves that are explicit control loops. We have control loops around the uh, coding and the development. And we also have a control loop around actually managing the infrastructure. So there's lots and lots of control loops and all nested within each other. And really, those are within the, the greater, um, it's, it's worth pointing that these are, are really part of a greater whole that moves all the way up to the agile uh, feedback mechanisms, uh, things like retrospective, which is, are essentially human system control loops. Uh, that's, that's how I, I tend to think of them. Um, these are ways of bringing information into the system and changing the system based on the information from the external inputs. Um, and really, that's what we're doing here. Cool. So principles of GitOps, um, we've talked about these yesterday. The entire system de is described declaratively. The canonical desired state is versioned in Git. Approval, approved changes can be automatically applied to the system and software agents ensure correctness and alert when the, um, when the system drifts away from its desired configuration. Cool. So declaratively, I, I, I really like to belabor the point that this is data, not code. Um, data is implementation independent. It's very easy to abstract. Code is, I mean, we have tools to abstract code, uh, but data is actually quite easy to abstract uh, in, in, in cheaper ways and less complex ways. Uh, it's much easier to validate for correctness. If you think validating code for correctness is easier than data, I'd like you to, I'd like to introduce you to Alonzo Church and Alan Turing and the very bedrock of kind of computer science, really. Uh, this is where it all kind of started. Um, it's hard, right? Verifying and validating code is genuinely difficult. It's fundamentally difficult. In fact, you can't, there are certain things that you cannot validate without actually running the code. Um, so, so really, when we move to data, we're, we're skipping that problem altogether, which is, which is a big deal. That is a, a categorical difference when we move to data. And it's much easier to generate and manipulate, right? Within, within the first few weeks of you as your life as a developer, um, you will have written and read structured data from a file. Right? So, so pretty much it's, it's very accessible uh, once you describe the system declaratively. Everything is versioned. We've talked about this canonical source of truth. That's the don't repeat yourself principle. Um, and it's trivial to roll back. Right? What I really like about this, and, and I don't think we've talked about this yesterday, is that having this declaration in a state, in a version state store, really um, democratizes the access between humans and machines. Um, I, I, I sound like some AI right side bucket, but uh, really what I mean is that it's a really good place for human and software to interact together. Uh, and so that all the checks you put in place can be reused for both, uh, for both agents. So you can have a software agent making commits or making pull requests, and then you can, you can have a human agent making commits and making pull requests. And essentially any verification you do um, can uh, apply to both uh, both processes, human or age, software agent. Uh, and also that means you can start doing things, automating the things that humans do uh, often, but can be automated. 
as Michael Hasenblatt mentioned yesterday, um, we should concentrate. We should concentrate the work of software on things that are um, repeatable, um, that are kind of always the same. That humans are not good at this thing. So basically, get software to do the things that software is good at. Get humans to do the things that humans are good at. Uh, everything is applied automatically. That's where you get the velocity gains. Um, we want to separate what and how here, and that's around the privilege escalation and how we move the credentials into the operator inside the security boundary. And finally, we, we have things that continuously ensure correctness, right? That's that's really the key. That's closing the, the, the control loop. And I'll talk about closing the loop quite a lot um, here, during this, uh, this workshop, but uh, really, the closing the control loop is what GitOps is about. Um, and what's quite neat here is it's easy to recover, recover from what I call PEPCAC or picnic error, uh, problem in chair, not in computer errors. So if, if you're an operator, and, and as an operator, I can tell you that I do this way more often than I'd like to admit, but you'll make mistakes. Um, you'll make mistakes. And, and this is a way of avoiding those mistakes. And when you even, when you actually do make a mistake, because the system self-corrects and converges to a known good state, uh, your mistakes will but essentially be erased automatically, uh, which is a good feature. That's a positive feature. Okay, talk about security a little bit. I don't think we've, we've um, explained in detail what, what that is. Um, really, this is a typical CI pipeline. So, so this is your typical non-GitOps CI pipeline. And I think Tiffany mentioned this um, yesterday. Uh, and really, when you move to GitOps, you're moving the actual deployment inside of your cluster, inside of your environment infrastructure. Um, so once you've got that and the deployment is reacting to your desired configuration, your desired canonical state, your, your state essentially from your state store, which is Git. Um, and, and then you have operators, and those could be a human, those could be software, actually manipulating that state. Um, and you'll notice here that there's there's no uh, there's no credential in the CI pipeline, right? You're removing those altogether, and that's that's a massive improvement in um, in the security. The, the surface area, the security surface area for uh, your CI pipeline. It's a massive reduction in the security surface area you have to care about because the CI pipeline no longer has direct access to your environments. Uh, the only thing it has access to is a right access to a some sort of um, state store. And I think um, Cornelia made a point very eloquently that you have this, um, this immutable boundary, which is your state store, your container registry, or your configuration re registry. Um, and that immutable boundary improves your security posture dramatically. And because you have a single point of entry into your environment, into how to manipulate your environment, that also means you have a single point of enforcement for policies and constraints. Um, that's a big deal in a lot of enterprises. A lot of enterprises care a lot about enforcing uh, their security policies or their compliance policies, and you might be legally requ required to do so. Uh, so it's a really good idea to centralize that so that you can enforce a common set of policy across all operations. If we had cube cuttle access, direct access to the infrastructure, this becomes much harder. It's much harder to validate, verify, um, and enforce policies when everybody can have SSH credentials into your machines. And you get awesome auditing. Really, if you if you configure your your environment correctly, uh, the auditing is is really second to none. Uh, people are, are going on about blockchains these days, but uh, I, I like to think of Git as the original blockchain, and I like to call it Merkle trees because I'm, I'm quite old fashioned. Uh, but essentially, you have exceptionally good guarantees, especially if you use things like sign commits that are cryptographically secure guarantees, um, which are, I, 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 I will happily move to any system that provides a, the same guarantees as Git. Um, for state storage, if I could find it, I've just not found it yet. So, so what, what what are we going to actually put on the control here? And, and I'm very sorry for my sins against the English language here, but but really we're talking about well everything, right? Kubernetes manifest, obviously, application configuration, uh, provisioning uh, configuration. So that's how you provision your infrastructure, your dashboards, your alerts, your runbooks, your application checklists. That's the policies you have around how your application should look. Uh, you're monitoring data pipelines and your secrets. Everything should be versioned. Everything should be immutable and put in an immutable version store um, without exception. Uh, and really, once you have a common store for those things, it becomes really easy to implement good patterns. So for example, uh, a good pattern is that every application has a dashboard, has alerts, and has a runbook. 
Well, you can check that on the pull request that deploys the application. You can verify that an application has those things if they're all versioned in a store, in a state repository, a state store. You can check that any commit is not going to create an application without a dashboard. You can verify good practice and enforce them at that level. And this is kind of a, a, a it's, it stops bad practices from actually getting into your production environment. Um, while not really being a, a as uh, let's, let's just say, as aggressive tool as a code review, right? You're having these things as automated PR uh, feedback from an automated agent, which has different social connotations from having a review from your uh, team lead or from the rest of your team uh, rejecting your changes. So there, there's some social aspect around that as well, around having automation uh, enforce good guidelines instead of uh, your peer group. So all the things, right? All the things should be under GitOps. I, I'm a massive believer that your entire company um, should be one Git push away from being restarted. We're not, we're very, very far from that, especially on the company side. Um, you can imagine the HR system and the finance systems are not managed this way yet. They will be, right? I believe everything, including your business processes, should be in a version store, uh, should be declared, uh, so that your entire company is essentially just a, a single piece of, declar of data. Uh, you're, you're encompassing the entire company of the data. Um, some of my colleagues, uh, some people in this industry think I'm a little crazy about this, uh, but, but I believe we will get there. Uh, and, and I think some of, the, uh, some of the slightly more eccentric members of the tech team community have already started moving in that direction. Uh, but, but to be determined when that actually happens. So why do we actually care? We've talked to, you know, to no end about why we care yesterday, really. So I'm, I'm kind of going to make this, um, skip over this because we've talked about this yesterday um, a lot, right? We talked about the motivation behind uh, Git, uh, GitOps a lot. Um, really, I, I think the one point we didn't make is the software human collaboration point, um, which, which I think is going to be more and more important as we have smart agents making decisions about infrastructure. Um, okay, so uh, let's set up a cluster. Uh, to do set up a cluster, we're gonna be using uh, DigitalOcean. Um, now, if you don't have a DigitalOcean login, um, relax, um, or you can create one yourself. It will ask you for your credit card details when you sign up. Um, honestly, we're gonna be using this for maybe an hour or so. Uh, you're going to incur less than 10, less than a, a dollar, certainly less than a cup of coffee if you do sign up for the first time. If you already have an account, I, I think you'll be okay. Um, the reason I chose uh, DigitalOcean is they're really quick for setup, so it's uh, it's good for, um, it's really good for demos and, and tutorials because they, they, they can be spun up super, super fast. Okay, so um, let's go into uh, DigitalOcean and actually um, set up, create a cluster. I'll need to find my... Uh, I'll need to forgive me, I'll need to go find my uh, desktop. So if I go into DigitalOcean, I go to the home of my project, I can create a new cluster, Kubernetes. Uh, I can check my region, check my pool. I'm gonna change my nodes. I don't, I, we really don't need uh, fancy nodes here. Uh, and click create cl cluster. But well, within a few minutes, we should have a cluster up and running. Uh, this will come up here. And the node pool is just coming up. So if you're, if you're, this is a good opportunity for you to log in. Um, you can see I've, I've been running multiple clusters since yesterday, and you can see my usage in the top right. So, so uh, relax for the credit card details if, if you're going to be uh, signing up. We'll be deleting everything by the end of, uh, by the, end of the day. So um, yeah, I, I, I've got this uh, cluster up and running, but but hang on, hang on, Brice. There's, there's, there's something something wrong here. There's something deeply wrong. That's that's not GitOps, right? We're not doing GitOps. We're going to get a cluster. We're going to get a Kubernetes cluster, but we want to do that via GitOps. Surely, we want to declare our cluster. That's that's the entire point of this conference. So, uh, how do we do this right? Yeah, I, I agree. That's not GitOps. We're going to get a cluster here, and, and it's coming up, and it will be up in a few minutes, but. How would we do this if we wanted to declare everything? Right. Well, let's do it the GitOps way. So to start, we'll, we'll need some sort of tooling, right? We, because we're manipulating files and we're going to need to call APIs and we're going to need to set up a set of operators, we're going to need to set up a tooling environment. So let's tackle that first. Let's, let's build a small, simple uh, machine on which we have all our tooling. 
Now, in an ideal world, you would do that declaratively, but uh, there's got to be a lowest turtle somewhere. So, so we're going to call the environment, the dev environment, uh, the lowest turtle that we're going to do imperatively. So let's create a droplet. Instead of an entire cluster, we'll just have a machine, and then we'll run, use that machine to do all the GitOps instead of our cluster. And once that's done, we can get rid of that machine. Okay. So instead of a cluster, I'm, I can delete this guy. And I'll create a droplet. So this will just be a virtual machine. I'm going to choose Ubuntu Basic. I don't need a lot of uh, power. I'm going to put it in London because that's the nearest location to me, so it should be faster. Uh, I'm going to use an SSH key here, but feel free. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, of course. So I've uh, I've just been asked by the uh, by the moderators to zoom in a little bit because it's it's a little bit hard to see. So yeah, so I, I'm creating a cluster here. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a cluster. I'm creating a, a dev machine. This could be your local environment. I'm going to use a kind of off-the-shelf environment here uh, just so we can have a re reproducible tutorial. Uh, if you wanted to install the tools on your own, please feel free to do so. Um, and, and we'll go through what tools you're going to need soon. So I, I've got SSH key set up, but feel free to create a password if you're doing this. I only need one droplet. Let's create this. So this should be up very shortly. So let's take a look at what we're going to do. So we're going to set Ubuntu uh, basic, the smallest instance we can get hold of, uh, local uh, region, choose a password or as, add your SSH key. So essentially what we're, we're getting is um, uh, a, a dev machine that has Ubuntu running so that we can run the setup scripts. So let's connect to our, root, our dev environment. Obviously, we need it to be up and running, so we'll wait. This droplet here, we've got a public IP. It should be up and running. So I can switch to my console. Um, please give me a shout when this is big enough. through the uh, certificate acceptance dance. Cool. We have a machine. We, we have now got a, uh, a dev environment we can start manipulating and, and changing. Um, so it, it might be a good idea. I, I can't quite see the chat or the comments and things, but um, if, you, uh, if, if you've managed to get something like that up and running, um, let us know in the comments. If you're following along, but you've still not got, got there quite yet, also let us know in the comments. And uh, Stacy, who's, who's moderating behind the scene, um, and, and uh, will let me know um, whether you've managed to reach this point yet. So I'll, I'll give everybody a few minutes uh, for the sake of this uh, workshop to uh, reach this point. We want a Ubuntu machine up and running that you have access to. So now we have our, our development environment up and running. Uh, we're going to be installing a set of dependencies. Um, the dependencies we're going to have are Pulumi which is our, our configuration and infrastructure dec declaration language. Flux, which is the GitOps agent we're going to be using. Python virtual environment, that's just a little bit of housekeeping for Pulumi. And kube control, which is going to allow us to inspect our cluster. Uh, now, we're going to get kube control, and we're going to have read access and write access to our cluster in practice once we set it up. But uh, honestly, um, kube control, uh, once you've got it in production, will only ever have read access. Uh, to your cluster. And that, that'll be to be able to debug what's going on, to be able to observe what's going on rather than to modify the cluster. So I, I can uh, take this tiny URL setup GitOps day. Uh, let me run this into my terminal. So I'm on my dev machine. L minus L so I can follow um, redirects. And uh, you can see, whoop, I think I might have got the wrong set of GitHub stays. I've just got them the wrong way around. So this uh, is just a small script that uh, actually installs all the dependencies. Uh, I, I promise you nothing nefarious is going on in that script. Hit the shell. 
get a welcome message. And as I said, all of this will be made available to you after uh, the GitOps day. So if you want to go and follow this along at home afterwards in your own time, uh, please feel free to do so. And now we're, we're going to uh, grab hold of uh, the various new, um, new shortcuts. Cool, so we now have a GitOps days environment that we're now ready. Uh, we can check this. Check that uh, oop, root cube config, right? There's no cube config yet. We haven't got a cluster. We have no cube config. That seems pretty reasonable. Um, so we have a, a set of environment. Flux is installed. Lumi is likewise installed. Uh, and, and the fine, so kubectl is also installed. Right, so we have all our dependencies up and running with that little script. So I'll leave this here for just a few moments. Uh, so those of you, if, if you want to follow along, um, you can grab this URL. It's just tinyurl.com set up GitOps days. It'll give you a shell script uh, that will set up an, uh, a development environment. It's designed for Ubuntu. If you're not running on Ubuntu, this, this script will not work. Um, but if you're following along and you've set up your own uh, development machine on uh, DigitalOcean, this will work uh, just fine out of the box. OK, so we, we, we've got our, our dependencies up and running. So, so this is a kind of second checkpoint, is we, we now have Pulumi, we have Flux, uh, we have Virtual Env, although we, we don't, we're not going to deal with this directly, really, uh, not just yet. So now it's time to uh, think about um, creating an access token for DigitalOcean. So DigitalOcean uh, will, will let us uh, create access tokens so that we can talk to its API, essentially. So that's what we're going to do next. Uh, and that's going to allow us to use the API declaratively, right? We're going to be able to declare what we want. And then an agent is going to take our declaration and, and turn it into a bunch of API requests. Now, uh, I believe, um, from what I remember from reading the docs, that the DigitalOcean API is already declarative. It's a REST API, which really, uh, it's a uh, crew. Well, it has CRUD uh, semantics, but it, you can just declare things on there as well. Um, but uh, we're going to be creating that token. So to create the token, go to your um, DigitalOcean uh, page. You can scroll down to the left uh, at the bottom. It says API. Click on API. Tokens keys. You can create a new personal token. Now, you'll notice here that uh, I've already got a few up there, but uh, I can create a new token. Uh, and uh, what I'm, what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to create, click generate token. This is live. This is going to be on YouTube. So I, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen just a few seconds, uh, just so I can copy that token without you guys seeing it. Uh, because, because I know some of you would be tempted to then go and, and spin up a Bitcoin miner on, on my own. And this is, this is, this is genuinely my own uh, DigitalOcean account. Uh, and, and I can't afford to mine Bitcoin for you guys. So let, let me stop my screen share just for a few seconds while I copied it. Um, so uh, I, I've created my token. I've added it to my environment. So now I, I should be good to go. I, I have that access token that lets me um, access uh, DigitalOcean and uh, create resources from the command line. So now we have a dev machine, right? We, we have a, a fully functional dev machine suitable for our tutorial today. Um, so the next step is let's start declaring our cluster. Let's create a cluster declaratively. Now we have all the tools we need. Um, it didn't take too long for us to set them up. I promise you, if you're going to be following this at home uh, on your own time, it won't take you very long to set this up either, uh, no matter what your machine is. Uh, Flux, Pulumi, and the Cube Control command line uh, are widely available in almost all distribution, Mac, Linux, and even Windows, if you must. Um, uh, I, I believe all of that will work as expected. So what we're going to do now is log into Pulumi. Uh, and this is, Pulumi is going to be the thing that manages our infrastructure. And in this case, our infrastructure is Kubernetes itself. So we're going to be, um, we need a place to keep the state of our infrastructure, the last known state of our infra infrastructure. And Pulumi has a bunch of options to do this. We, we can use their service. So Pulumi is, a, is backed by a company, so we can use their service. We, we, need to, we would need to log in and have an account, though. Uh, you can use S3. You can use a, a variety of backends, but we'd have to set those up. 
So for today, what we're going to do is we're going to do it locally with files, right? We're going to be logging in locally with just some files. So if I uh, go into my console, I can do Pulumi, login local, and it'll tell me I'm logged in in the file system. Uh, that's, that's what I need to tell Pulumi that I'm going to be storing my state locally instead of storing it remotely. Uh, in a production setting, you'd want to store your state somewhere else. You'd want to store your state somewhere like an S3 bucket um, or, or some sort of remote state storage, redundant state storage. Um, for now, this, this is just a demo. We're, we're okay with the, with the limitations of storing state locally. Uh, once we've got our Pulumi um, installation up and running, and we, we've got, we've told it we're, we're going to be storing our state locally, what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be using it to generate a template, and that's just a bunch of boilerplate, really, uh, for Pulumi to uh, be able to manage infrastructure for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a, um, a, a directory for our infrastructure inside of a, a, a directory for our entire um, tutorial. Uh, and then we'll uh, initialize a, a set of files inside of that directory using Pulumi. Now, for this tutorial, I'm going to be using Python. I, I think it's very readable and it's very accessible for everybody who's, who's watching. But actually, it supports F Sharp, C Sharp, JavaScript, TypeScript, and GoLang. Right? In fact, pretty much anything that can target the CLR, that's a common language runtime for .NET, um, is capable of, of running Pulumi. Um, anything that can target JavaScript, including ClojureScript and the host of language that have proliferated on top of uh, Node.js uh, is capable of running Pulumi too uh, and Golang. So, so there's a variety of choices for you. Now, now one thing, I, I, one thing that um, one thing that is is not as perfect as it could be uh, is that Pulumi uses code; it doesn't use data, um, and and we'll see what that code looks like. The code is declarative, fundamentally. But it is still code, and it still is harder to uh, verify than pure YAML or pure data. Um, that is one of the issues I, I find with Pulumi. It's just that uh, it, it's a pragmatic choice um, that sadly violates one of the principles. But we'll see how it redeems itself uh, at the end of this tutorial uh, through some of the tooling that lets you build uh, the entire control loop. Uh, so, so this is a, a kind of a pragmatic choice, and I think that's what you'd. Uh, find in your own, in your own um, operations and your, your own development is um, the principles of GitOps are really um, there to guide you in a good direction, uh, but you're still allowed to make pragmatic, pragmatic choices along the way. Uh, and also, as we've seen here, right, my development machine is set up imperatively. There needs to be a lowest turtle, right? There needs to be something at the bottom that is set up in, in some way that is not declarative that can support the declaration of other things. Now, um, if you've uh, if you've ever bootstrapped a language, um, if you've ever done that exercise, um, you'll understand that there are techniques for essentially bootstrapping a declarative system so that it stands on declarative ground. Uh, but essentially, it, it involves a lot of um, juggling between declarative and imperative. You set up an imperative system that sets up a declarative system that sets up a declarative system, and then you remove the imperative system. Um, it's a lot of hassle, and, and pragmatically, uh, it's almost never warranted. Uh, it's it's okay to leave. Yeah, so the question from chat around uh, preferences between Pulumi and Terraform. Uh, honestly, I like Terraform too, and I've used Terraform a lot. Um, the, the reason I'm, I'm using Pulumi here in this tutorial, I actually started writing with Terraform, uh, is that they recently, Pulumi recently put out a, and, and, and we we'll revisited this, this particular topic, they put out a Kubernetes operator, which lets, uh, lets Pulumi have a, a really well-rounded control loop in a way that Terraform operators still aren't quite as mature yet. Uh, so, so we'll recover, we'll, we'll, we'll regain this. This is why I'm using Pulumi here instead of Terraform. Terraform is, has a better language, in my opinion. It's more declarative, it's more data-driven than Pulumi, which is code. Now, having code gives you a lot of power, but also makes it very hard to verify in a way that Terraform doesn't have that problem. Um, so I, I, I really, the reason I'm choosing Pulumi for this tutorial is because of the operator. Uh, and we'll talk about close, that operator at the end. Um, that's why I made that choice. Uh, I think it's, as I said, um, it's an, um, I, I want to make you feel comfortable with making pragmatic choices here when you, when you implement GitOps yourself. Um, it's not, you know, it, it violates one of the principles. I, 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 I am aware of that and I, I've mentioned it. 
but also it's it's it has some other benefits that let you uh, do useful things operationally. Um, hopefully, it'll make more sense when I actually reach that section where we talk about the Pulumi operator. Okay, um, so let, let's actually go go ahead and do this. Let's let's make this to tutorial uh, directory. You'll notice I make a lot of typos. That's that's just me in general, but it's uh, uh, made worse by the fact that everybody's watching uh, as usual. Okay, right, so now we're in our folder. Uh, let's actually create the required files. I'm going to call my project uh, GitOps Days. It's fine. Dev is fine. Um, you can choose a passphrase for your secrets. Just remember that passphrase. But passphrase. So one thing that we haven't done is we need uh, the Python virtual env. Uh, so let's actually install that. Must have forgotten to add that to the uh, file. That's uh, that's quite annoying. Uh, you'll have to do this too. I will fix the file by the time you get the links to everything. Um, So this is really dull and boring, but we're just getting virtual env up and running so that Pulumi, so it can manage its dependencies. Uh, we're using Python libraries, so we're using the Python uh, packaging. Figures for BandDB. That's that's quite unexciting. So let, let's uh, while this is running, let's take a look at what this actually does for us. Um, we've actually created, and, and it, I'll show it in the console myself. But we we actually create a, several files here. Pulumi will create several files for us. One is git ignore. It'll ignore kind of things we don't want around the Python and ecosystem. It creates some Pulumi configuration files, which will include things like uh, Pulumi secret references, not. Si or encrypted secrets, various uh, environment variables for the Pulumi infrastructure, a main.py in which we're going to be declaring our infrastructure, and a requirements text, which is our dependencies. So that's what we're going to be seeing on the console once we've run Pulumi uh, new. Let's take a look. It's still processing triggers for MandDB. We will get there. Here we go. So Pulumi. Uh, new Python. Here we go. Uh, because I've run it before, it's already generated some files. I, I'm not worried about that. I'm going to call it GitOps Days. Minimum dev. It's dev already exists. Let me choose a, a another stack. Demo stack. That's doing much better uh, than it did the first time around. So if I have a look at what's in this, I'm just going to remove the Pulumi dev. We don't need that one. It doesn't really remove the stack, but we'll uh, we'll not worry about that just yet. So as I mentioned, this is. Um, The install tree, so I can show you. So Pulumi has now generated our default files, so let's go and take a look at those.
So let's take a look at Lumi.demo. That's just giving us a encryption source and Pulumi parameters for the demo stack. How about Pulumi.yaml? That's defining our Pulumi environments, what language we're going to be using, and some metadata about the project. And main is literally the simplest Pulumi program you could have, which is a Python program that imports Pulumi. And finally, our requirements are just uh, the requirements for Python. Don't worry if you don't know Python. Um, this is really just an example. Uh, pick a language that you do know um, and that you're familiar with to run through this yourself. OK, so we have now got Pulumi environment up and running with our various, uh, various uh, files uh, ready for us to start developing and declaring our cluster. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to create a declarative cluster configuration. Now, if you're uh, following along, um, I, I'm sure Stacy will be able to paste this URL in Slack. Uh, it's just basic Pulumi Kubernetes, uh, and this will point you to a, this particular file right now. Now, I, I recommend changing the name. This does say Breeze Demo Cluster. You probably want it to be called something else. Uh, but for me, I'm just going to cop copy that link, and I'll be able to curl this file into my environment. I'm just going to overwrite main. So now, if I have a look at my file, that's why you should use the. Uh, make sure you use the L if you're going to curl this file, so that you can have a redirection follow. There you go. That's better. So this is now our declaration for our cluster. Uh, let me change the name. Let me go for dem live demo cluster. So this is now how we're going to be um, declaring our cluster. Now, I mentioned that Pulumi is code. And right now, we're going to be the, using the DigitalOcean uh, library for Pulumi. But if you, uh, if you squint, um, essentially, our cluster definition very much is um, declarative. It's just data. We're not actually um, adding any other um, attribute. We're not running any code. This is just a piece of data, really, that has a name, a declaration for the nodes that we're going to be using, a region, and a version. Now, um, you, you'll feel free to keep it in London. Otherwise, look up the uh, DigitalOcean regions and uh, add, add to them yourself. But essentially, this is just a declaration. We can imagine that this could be a, a piece of YAML too, and that that would be perfectly acceptable. Um, and finally, once we've actually declared our cluster, I'm just going to be exporting the cube config for our cluster so we can use it to read what's on the cluster itself. Uh, now, for those of you using DigitalOcean, please note, this is important, um, that DigitalOcean will rotate the credentials for your cube config every seven days. So the cube config from DigitalOcean is not suitable uh, for long-term use because the credentials get rotated quite sensibly, I might add. So you have to do different things, and you have to grab the cube config in another way uh, if you're going to be using this over a longer period of time. Now, this tutorial should not last seven days. I, I should hope not. Uh, so uh, it won't matter for us today. But it will matter for you if you actually run this at home or if you try and re re recover your cluster after seven days. So just be aware of this. Uh, if, if you need help working around that, give us a shout. Literally, just send me an email and say, hey, Brice, I've just said that issue, that issue you talked about during your workshop. Uh, what do I do now? Uh, and I'll send you the appropriate Pulumi uh, uh, Python that will kind of wrangle the, the right cube config back out of your, uh, your uh, DigitalOcean instance. Anyway, caveat um, over. Uh, now we have a Kubernetes cluster. We also have a, we've ex exporting the Kubernetes clusters configuration uh, cube config. I think we, we're good to go. Uh, and so the next step, once we have this, once we've actually declared our cluster, is to actually uh, we need to do a few things. Uh, so the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to 
um, set up our, our dependencies. So you'll notice in my cluster configuration here, I'm importing another library besides Pulumi, which is Pulumi DigitalOcean. Now we've not imported that. We've not uh, managed that library just yet. So we'll need to do that. So let's start with uh, importing that library. So uh, Pulumi has set up a virtual environment for us. And as I said, uh, do not worry if this is unfamiliar, if you're not familiar with Python, um, this is uh, not very important. This is just a dependency management, uh, and this is Python-specific dependency management. So, so really, really relax if this is not familiar. Um, we can check that we're actually in our virtual environment. Yep, we are indeed. We're going to be installing uh, Pulumi DigitalOcean. Better if you spell it right. Cool. So now I've got my dependencies up and running uh, in my uh, in my uh, virtual environment. I'm just going to go pip freeze, uh, which actually just gives us a list of all the dependencies. And I'm just going to use that and put that in the requirements file. Once again, if none of this is, is familiar to you, relax. This is just Python specific stuff. Don't worry too much about it. So now I should be ready to actually run my uh, my Pulumi. So now we have all the defense C, I uh, should be ready to run my, my Pulumi to actually implement our declaration on, on, on the real system, on, on the digital ocean. The last thing we're going to need is we're actually going to need to tell Pulumi how to access uh, digital ocean. So you remember at the beginning, we, we created a DO token environment variable for this purpose of um, actually telling Pulumi to how to access digital ocean. Uh, and we're going to do that again today. Uh, I'm going to call, I'm going to create a Pulumi uh, configuration, secret configuration variable for digital ocean token. Uh, so let's go do that in my environment right now. So Pulumi config set digital ocean colon token. Now I should have the digital ocean token up and running in my, in my environment. This is in fact a secret, right? Pulumi will not write that out too. Uh, I guess I don't have the DigitalOcean. Now I've saved that up in my, uh, whoop, there we go. Now I'll need to unlock my secret so the secret is um, uh, encrypted. I'm also going to add my secret configuration um, to uh, to my environment, so and this is something I, I like to do for projects. Um, So now I should no longer have to type in my passphrase every time because it's in my environment. So now we're ready. This is this is it, right? We're, we're going to be running Pulumi to actually create some sort of infrastructure. Uh, to do that, we'll just call Pulumi up. It's going to give us an idea of what it's going to try and do. So it's creating a stack. Um, it's inside that stack is going to create a Kubernetes cluster. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish to perform this. I wish to do this. So I can click yes, and it will start to create my cluster. And we have about 40 minutes remaining. We're about halfway through this workshop, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so we have a little bit of time left. Uh, this will not take very long. And we can actually jump into our UI, our uh, DigitalOcean UI. We can see that this cluster is now being created. We've got Breeze Live Demo Cluster uh, being created right now. So essentially, we're now, uh, we are now creating our infrastructure based on the declaration. Um, now, you'll, you'll notice that this is not, we've not committed anything to a Git repository, and, and I will talk about this later. Uh, as I said, there has to be a lowest turtle 
Um, and I'll, I'll give you some, some tips and some hints about how to make that lowest turtle as declarative as possible and how to run this entire loop declaratively and autom automatically, right? Because we, we don't really want to be doing Pulumi up by hand. We want to be pushing some configuration to a, a repository and have Pulumi up run independently uh, without our intervention. And I'll show you what tools to use to do that shortly. Now, it'll take a little bit of time uh, for the cluster to come up, but uh, we're not going to continue with uh, our presentation. Now, one thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to have um, read access to our cluster. Um, we'll need to be able to um, create a cube configuration file, uh, and then we'll be able to use that to access our cluster. So once this is done, um, we'll go about making that uh, configuration file. Now, since this, this is going to take a couple of minutes, um, I think it's a good time for a short break. Um, I, I, I don't think we have DJ uh, Desired State up and ready, uh, primed for, for another session just yet. But we'll take a, a short five minute break um, while we have that cluster up and running. Mashing. So I, I, I'm, I'm told music will be, uh, will be up and running. So let's take a, a short break. I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll come back. It's uh, 22 past 11 now. Uh, let's call it a three minute break at 22, 20, uh, at uh, 25 past 11 uh, while we have this cluster up and running. It gives you time to get a coffee, get a tea, or uh, take a bio break. Welcome back. Hopefully, uh, you've managed to stretch your legs, um, get a drink, take a bio break. Our cluster is still creating, but I promise you it won't be very long. It's almost done. And then we can get going with our, our actual Kubernetes cluster. So hopefully, Hopefully, within, within a few seconds, uh, we'll be able to uh, poke, here we go, uh, literally right on time, uh, to be able to talk to our Kubernetes cluster. So this, is, this completes the creation. And if I go back to the UI, I should see it up and running. And it, it is indeed up and running. Uh, we've, we've waited for all the nodes to be up and running. The, uh, usually, the API, the Kubernetes API, is, is uh, up quite quickly. But uh, Pulumi and the DigitalOcean user interface will quite wisely wait for everything to be up and running uh, before giving you the all clear. So now we, we can create our cube, um, our cube config file. Um, we have what are called stack outputs. Uh, if I just run this, it'll tell you, you know, we have one stack output whose uh, name is Pulumi cube config, and the value is this entire YAML file. So what we can do is actually save this. Uh, it's, uh, it's complaining that my cube directory doesn't exist. Let's fix that. Cool. So now we should be able to use kubectl, uh, which has been installed as part of the dependencies. Let's get all the pods and, and hope it all works. Uh, we, have we managed to declare a cluster? And we have indeed. So this is uh, what your cluster looks like. We can also take a look at the machines. So there are two worker machines. That's my specification. If you remember in my, um, in my configuration file for my cluster, uh, I only have two machines. So the node count is two. I've taken a very small machine. And so now we're seeing that we have two machines up and running on our cluster. This is good. This is exactly where we want to be. Uh, so hopefully, you've managed to get yourself a cluster up and running just as well. Um, if you haven't, once again, um, relax. You can follow at home later on from the files I'll send. Um, and really, if you have a way of getting a cluster some other means, uh, whether that's AWS or uh, GKE or uh, even Kind, uh, all of this will work just as well. Um, this is just a way of making sure that everybody who's watching can participate and do this, uh, no matter what your machine is. And I don't have to worry about local dependencies um, for your machine when doing this. OK, so we have a dev machine. We have a cluster. Uh, but, but what about a Git repository, right? How are we going to put together a Git repository? Well, let's make one, right? Let's let's start by making a Git repository in uh, on our local dev machine. I'm inside of uh, infra folder. 
But uh, I'm actually going to make my Git repository inside of GitOps today. So Git, Git here, Git add infra, Git status, make sure that we're only adding files that we want, and we are. Git commit. And now it's kind of, uh, of course, uh, we, we need to tell, we need to tell Git who we are. So let's do that. Um, so this is me. If that doesn't come as a surprise. If you it comes as a surprise, you're in the wrong workshop. Uh, so now we've told Git who we are. We should be able to make that commit, that initial commit without an issue. There we go. Good. So so now we have a Git commit, a Git repository, with our state in. Um, is this sufficient? Are, are, are we GitOps yet? Are, are, I mean, are, are we managing to be what what's what's going on? Uh, well, we, we'll need a remote repository too. So so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I don't want. I don't know why it's trying to connect to my Microsoft. Uh, cool. So let's create a remote repository as well. Um, and we can do that on GitHub. So let me jump back out. I can create a new repository. Public, create. Cool. So now I've got an SSH endpoint. Um, the, I can't clone that repository just yet because GitHub doesn't know who I am. So um, let's actually create a key uh, on our development machine. So grab our public key and create a new key in Git. So I'm having issue with scrolling today. This is going to be awkward. So we go into our Git. Uh, Profile inside, uh, I think it's Git setting rather. So Git settings, and in here should have SSH and GPG keys. We can add in new SSH keys, add this to our uh, Git account. And we have our, our new key. Cool. So now we have our key. Uh, so Git will know who we are. So we should be able to now clone and control our repository. So if I go back to my repositories, grab that, and then we can set it up. Git origin. Push that up to our remote. Cool. So now we have a new branch here, which we can take a look at. And our infrastructure is now committed to Git, right? We have all our infrastructure information in here. So you should do the same if you're following along. You should create your repository. So we've now created a remote repository with our configuration. Uh, we've just added our remote repository to, um, 
so that we can control it from our development environment. And we've got created an initial commit with our infrastructure file. So now we have Flux, we have uh, Kubernetes. So we have a development machine, we have Kubernetes, and we have Git. But, but that's that's not GitOps, right? Clearly, what's going on? Where, where's the GitOps loops? Well, how are we going to set up GitOps? This is not yet GitOps. We just have a few things, right? We have uh, the declared manifest. We have the version in that we have the uh, manifest in Git. But we can't um, move change uh, move changes automatically to our infrastructure, and we have no software agents running that is managing all this uh, this deployment pipeline. So let's install the GitOps agent, right? This is the next step, installing the GitOps agents. So what we'll need to do is um, we'll need to create a personal access token so that the GitOps agent can control repositories on make commits and read commits uh, on our Git, in our GitHub. So let's do that. Let's create a, a GitHub, a personal access token for our Git, uh, GitOps agent. I go back into Git, I go into my settings once again. In settings, you can find developer settings. In developer settings, you'll find personal access token. You can see some I made earlier, quite a few. I can generate a new one that has repo. I can call it GitOps Days Live Demo Token. I can generate the token. Copy this and add it to my credentials. So. so now I should be able to access the GitHub API source that file, of course. I need to be, I'll be able to access the GitHub API using my uh, token so that I can create and manage repositories remotely. And finally, we actually launched the GitHub agents, right? So let's actually take this Flux Bootstrap GitHub uh, and, and actually implement the GitHub agent. I'll leave this. Um, on for just a few seconds uh, for people to, to have a look at this. The Flux uh, Bootstrap help is available. So if you just do Flux Bootstrap minus minus help, you'll, you'll get a, a clear idea of the uh, variety of options that the Flux um, utility lets you uh, configure. For, for us, we're gonna do uh, just several things. We're gonna say an owner, a repository. So the owner is whoever you are on GitHub, uh, the repository, the name of the repository you want, the branch, what branch you're going to be looking at, the path for manifests. This is important. So where where should Flux look inside of that repository for manifests that is going to deploy to Kubernetes? And finally, we're going to tell Flux that this is a personal repository. Uh, there are different API calls for personal repositories and organization and team repositories. So we're just telling Flux which which type we are. All right, let's go. Let's go and do this. Let's go and implement this. So I've got Flux. Let's just uh, let's just check we actually have Flux up and running. Oh, my new comment version. Never mind. Let's do a check instead. It should be much happier now because we've got the uh, kube control command line and the kube config. So Flux is uh, now happy. So we can do Flux bootstrap GitHub. I'm the owner. That's my GitHub username. Repository, we are going to be using. Uh, let me take a look at my repository. My repository name is GitOps Days Live 2020. This is a personal repository going to use the master branch. I, I believe the new um, the new branches are, are main. Uh, I think I, I need to update my Git version for it to do that by default. Um, uh, so personal repository, I'm the owner, the repository name, branch master, and finally the path uh, is going to be Kubernetes. Let me double 
if I've got everything right. Path, branch, repository, owner, person. Sounds good to me. Uh, let's actually go and run this. So it'll do a lot there. Uh, it's actually going to generate a, a quite a lot of logs, and we'll break those down when it's, uh, when it's all done. So if you're following along, uh, I'll, I'll move back to the command line. So you can type, in, type that in yourself. I, I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken, Lee showed this uh, late last night, but you might not have caught his presentation. Um, do we have any more questions in the meantime while well, this is actually up and running? Yeah, please. Um, let, let me uh, let me go read that. Um, should I? So uh, uh, Ilya, who's uh, yeah, yes, please. That would be wonderful. Um, yeah. So Ilya, who's a former colleague, has, has made a comment. Let me go see uh, see what he says. Um, yep. Perfect. Um, would love to see JK also. So, um, <laughs> um, so Ilya, Ilya made the comment um, that it's it's much harder to validate YAML um, if you have something more than just trivial. Um, whereas with config as code, if you have code like Pulumi, Pulumi's code base, you can have unit tests um, that are based around your abstractions. Uh, I, I mean, I um, whereas whereas YAML, it's much harder to um, validate. Uh, you can write the validate tool, but it's much harder to apply those tools in different repository, different projects, and it's only really viable to validate YAML in mono repository settings. So this is Ilya's comment. Um, whereas a proper language, you can write unit tests for each component uh, at the level of the component. Now, um, I, I I think I, I understand what you mean, actually, Ilya, and, and I would tend to agree with you that um, unit tests on configuration as code, if it's actually code, is, is quite nice. Um, but that's a limitation of YAML, not of declarative formats in general. YAML is limited. Um, YAML has issues with typing. It has issue with validation. It doesn't come with a schema. There's a lot of issues with YAML um, that are be beyond just uh, declarative um, declaration, right? So I, I, I will. I, I think I will stick to my gun around how declarations or, or essentially data is easier to validate than code. Um, in, in almost every way. Um, I will say that YAML itself as a way of declaring, uh, as a way of describing your infrastructure is limited. And I agree with you that in terms of the tooling for YAML and the tooling for Pulumi and Python, like the, the, the ecosystem around Python validation and verification is extremely mature, right? The, the language has been around for well over a decade now, um, pr probably more than two decades. I, I, I can't remember when Python was created. Um, so anyway, so the language is very, the language testing tools are extremely mature. Um, the language, the tools around YAML for composition are basically non-existent, right? They're, they're a very poor composition. So this is one of my, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but hopefully you'll, you'll all find it interesting. I think this is a really good comment. Um, uh, and it, it raises what uh, one of the fundamental problem of a lot of declarative languages, languages um, have, which is they lack composition primitives. So YAML has no real composition primitive besides having a sub-object, right? You can't compose two different YAML objects, which means it's much harder to, uh, when, you, when you're working in the large, it's much, much harder to, to create compound objects. Um, what, what I really want is YAML with a, a fully algebraic data type. Um, if you've ever worked in languages like Haskell, F-sharp, um, OCaml, ML, uh, you, you'll know exactly what I mean by, by wanting a, a uh, algebraic data type. Um, when you have that as a primitive for your data language, you, you get rid of a lot of those problems. So I think I, I would tend to agree around the testing tools being superior for Python than for YAML, um, almost to a fault. I think that's true. Um, but I think the fundamental problem here is, is one of YAML not being very well suited for those kind of use cases rather than declarative format per se being a bad idea. Um, that, that's my take on it. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point you're making actually uh, around, for, for trivial example, it's pretty easy to validate YAML, but when it gets much more complicated, because of how YAML composes, 
it gets much harder because the composition primitives aren't there and the, there's no real uh, there's a the kind of a an explosion of different tooling around YAML composition. Uh, whereas if you use Pulumi and Python, it's, it's very straightforward to, to write unit tests. Um, I, 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 I agree, but um, I think that's a specific example rather than a general point about declarative and, procedu and procedural uh, uh, management. Um, I, I hope that thoroughly answers the question and, and provides a, a welcome distraction for everybody else who's listening. Um, Okay, so we we finished, right? We we we've got our GitHub uh, GitOps agents up and running. Surely, uh, surely this is us done, right? We we have all all this. Uh, let's actually go check Flux now. Let's do a full Flux check. And yeah, it, it seems to be passing everything. Everything seems to be very happy. Uh, so uh, we've, we've, we've got GitOps, we, we, we've done GitOps, right? We're done. Surely this is the end of the tutorial. Uh, I, I mean. What what actually happened here, right? What 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 did we actually do? So let's break down the actual logs log outputs. Uh, the first thing that happens is we're actually um, adding the agent definitions to Git. Uh, let me show you what I mean by that. So if I go into my Git repository now and I go to the root of my Git repository, you'll notice that Flux has added itself to my Git repository. The definition Flux is a very very well behaved GitOps operator or GitHub system. So it will add itself to your repository so that you're completely declaring Flux. So if you want to know what Flux is, it's explicit in here. It's very clear what Flux is. It will add itself to your repository. That's the first thing it does. Uh, let's take a look at the output. The second one it does is it actually installs the agent to the cluster. It's going to be putting the um, Flux agent, the live software agents, are going to be deployed to the cluster itself. So now we can see those agents. Let, let's actually go and take a look. If we do uh, kubectl, oh, once again, right, we have a set of agents, software agents running for us that are going to do these reconciliations so that whenever we change our repository, so does the system, so does the infrastructure. It's waiting for the agents to be deployed before performing a set of health checks. So that's what's actually happening, and that's what the Flux Bootstrap setup does. And as we mentioned, it's added its own manifest to our control repository in the directory we specified, Kubernetes uh, in this case. So now we have full control of the cluster, right? We, we can move from Git all the way to the cluster with application deployments, right? So now we can start thinking about operations with GitOps. How do we actually operate with GitOps? So let's take a, a really basic operation. Uh, the first thing we're going to need to do is, because Flux has changed the repository, let's just pull the latest version. And then we'll deploy a new uh, object into Kubernetes through the command line, through Git, really. We're only going to use Git. So let's do that now. So the first thing I want to do is pull the latest changes. We're done. I want to make a uh, directory, which is going to be my uh, my development namespace. In here, I'm going to create a YAML file that declares a namespace. And I'm going to call it dev. This is a kind. Namespace. It's very picky about um, it's the case sensitive, so so be aware if you're following along. That is my namespace. That's that's as far as we need to go for our namespace. I can add this file. Too, too used to my uh, to my friendly shortcuts. Here we go. Get to add namespace. Push it upstream. 
and then we should be able to watch. And we should expect the dev namespace to be to come up uh, in just a few seconds. So just to recap, we've pulled to get the latest version that Flux made in our repository. We created a new namespace. And then we pushed our commit upstream so that the Git, GitOps operator can pick that up from our, um, from our Git repository and we'll apply those changes to the cluster. It doesn't seem to be working, so what, what's going on? Let's take a look. How do we debug this? Well, the operator um, will actually output logs of what it's doing, um, as it should do. You'll notice these are structured logs. So let's take a look at those. We're looking at the customized controller. It's a bit of a misnomer here. Don't worry too much. I'm going to follow the logs. OK, so this was at uh, 11.49 We're 11.50. Let's take a look. Has it created our namespace? Reconciliation finished. Was I just too eager? Did I, was I just not waiting for my namespace? Quite possibly. Um, let's take another look. Yeah, here we go. Dev created 46 seconds ago. So um, I, I was just too eager to figure out what was going on. Um, but hopefully, uh, this also gives you an idea of what to do to check when things aren't happening correctly. And this is, we've got a really good log, actually structured log output from the operator uh, that in a production environment, you'd be aggregating, storing, and you'd be able to search uh, quite easily. Now, um, JSON log output is a love-hate relationship. Uh, it's, it's a little bit awkward to read. You can see the, the wall of text uh, on, the upper side, on the upper half of my terminal. But in practice, it, it helps to have structured log outputs uh, because in most situations, you'll never be reading the logs directly you're going to be aggregating those logs, indexing them, and be able to put them up for searches uh, in some log retrieval system. Uh, OK, so now we have our name namespace. We, we've essentially proved that we can close the loop on operations, right? Uh, we, we have our dev namespace. It's up and running. We've closed the loop on operations, right? We have the entire system de described declaratively. Check. We've, we've got a Git repository version state. Check. We can approve changes, uh, and they can be automatically applied. Check. Uh, software agents ensure correctness and alert on diff. Check. Uh, the uh, various software agents in the Flux system namespace. You make, you make uh, an order of magnitude more typos when people are watching. Uh, so the, uh, the agents in the Flux namespace will report on their status, will report on failures, et cetera, um, and will continually, um, will continually converge towards a known good state. Let me actually show you this in action. So we created the dev namespace. Um, let, me, uh, let me create a short alias. I'm getting tired of, of typing kubectl all the time. So we can see our dev namespace. Uh, whoop, uh, our dev namespace on our Kubernetes cluster. What 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 would happen if I was to delete that manually? Well, it deletes the namespace. So I send it to command. Deleted the namespace. So if I got the namespaces now, they'd go away. What about if we watch this? What about if we actually pay attention? And if our control loop is working, we would expect the namespace to come back at some point. Now, it's not going to be instantaneous, right? There, there's, a, there's a delay on how often it's going to do this. Uh, it might take a couple of minutes to get there, but it will eventually reconcile. And we should see the dev namespace come up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it to try to come back and reconcile on its own. 
Uh, while that's happening, we're going to co continue with the presentation. And hopefully, when we come back, the dev namespace will be back up and running. So now the, the question is, how do we, uh, we leverage this GitOps power to do more? Well, we want, we've, we've created a namespace. OK, so what? Right? Well, let's do some more. Let's do some more interesting things. Uh, we have um, about 20 minutes left. So hopefully, we can up, go up and deploy an application in that time. So what we're going to need to do to deploy an application app, because I want that application to be visible to the outside world. I want to go on a website, on a web page, and view my application. So I'm going to use an ingress controller to do that. So I'm going to install Project Contour uh, to actually uh, act as the ingress controller to my application. Uh, to do this, I'm going to create a new uh, folder for that uh, namespace. I'm going to grab the Project Contour YAML manifest from the Project Contour website. Uh, and place that in that new folder, uh, add those changes, and apply, uh, apply those changes. All right, let's go and do actually, actually go and do this. In the mean, five more minutes, OK. Uh, so I, yes, it's five more minutes, just uh, not 20. That's, that's on me. That's OK. Uh, let's try and see whether we can get uh, an application up and running. Uh, probably not uh, do an update, but we'll try and get it up and running. Uh, in the next five minutes. I, I think we should be able to do that. So we're making a new uh, directory. I'm going to grab the URL, so that's productcontour.io quickstartcontour.yaml. So now we have our product contour. Let's check on how our namespaces are doing. Still not quite there. It will eventually get there, I, I promise. Uh, you can change the uh, loop times, how, how long it takes to reconcile uh, as, a, as a parameter. Let's actually just put the contour in place. Uh, so git add utilities. Uh, contour. So now we're deploying, instead of a namespace, we're deploying an entire application stack. And you'll notice I have not touched my cluster yet, right? But I, I am expecting um, that my cluster will actually create the contour namespace. We can check the logs to see what's, whether when it will actually do that. There we go. So here we should shortly be expecting that the contour, the commit we made, will come up in the logs, and then it will be applied to our cluster. Yeah, so Andre, Andre asks a good question um, in Slack, um, whether uh, it's possible to use a Helm chart to deploy uh, Flux, or whether it's uh, the Flux bootstrap is the default way of doing it. The answer is it's perfectly possible to um, use a Helm chart to deploy Flux. Uh, Flux, as you've seen here, is just a set of manifests. It's just a set of Kubernetes resources, really. Uh, so you can deploy them however you like, including a Helm chart. I don't know whether the Helm chart is provided by default, but it's certainly possible to do a Helm chart. Um, I quite like the Flux Bootstrap, uh, but I agree that for, for example, configuring clusters, uh, it's, it's not uh, repeatedly, it's not uh, necessarily um, the best idea. So Flux, I believe, has the ability to generate the Helm charts for you and just output the Helm, the, uh, not the Helm chart, output the manifest files for you so you can just apply them to a, to a cluster as well. Uh, so the answer is it's possible. 
and um, new deployments can be created with Helm too. So it'll so the, the the new flux supports Helm out of the box. So you can have uh, Helm releases um, resources that point to Helm charts and data, uh, so that you can deploy your Helm components to your cluster using GitOps as well. All of this seems to have gone okay. Let's get the namespace. We can see that both dev and project contour are up and running. Now, I, I believe we're kind of slowly running out of time. Um, we're, we're almost uh, at the end of our uh, time together. So I'm just gonna, going to uh, jump straight to some of our concluding remarks, uh, which will hopefully um, uh, be useful to you. So, so one of the things I wanted to mention is uh, how do we close the loop on the cluster itself, right? We managed to close the loop on the application operations, but what we did not do is close the loop on the cluster. The cluster we configured manually using Pulumi, while it's declarative, there's no agent reconciling the cluster, um, but there can be. And that's one of the reasons why I chose Pulumi is there's a native Kubernetes operator managed by the Pulumi team. That means that um, if you declare your cluster configuration, you can have a agent that will monitor that cluster configuration and reapply it live. Um, and reconcile the infrastructure with your declarations. Now, this is, of course um, applies not just to Kubernetes. It doesn't just apply to Kubernetes at all because Pulumi is a general purpose tool for infrastructure management. So in fact, you can, you can uh, have a GitOps control loop for things like AWS, Azure, um, GCP, and a variety of other targeted infrastructure, including, for example, our friends DigitalOcean, right? Uh, and, and for the record, I am not associated or affiliated in any way with DigitalOcean. I just quite like their stuff. Um, and it's quite fast for this purpose. Um, so, so hopefully, um, really, um, I mean, this is definitely out of scope for, for this talk. And, and they've got a really great demo. Uh, if you search for just Pulumi Kubernetes operator, you'll, you'll find all the details. So a quick recap, uh, and then I'll, I'll pass on back over to Stacy and the rest of the team um, to for the rest of uh, GitOps days uh, today. So we reviewed the GitOps principles. We created a cluster declaratively. We provisioned a load balancer and an ingress controller declaratively. I didn't show the load balancer, but I promise you, if you followed the steps, uh, it is indeed there. And, and finally, we deployed uh, an application with GitOps. Well, we didn't quite get there. Uh, but we certainly did get to deploy a load balancer and ingress controller, which are essentially applications. Uh, we did close the loop on application operations. And I've talked about how we can close the loop on infrastructure operation with, let's say, the Pulumi operator. OK, thank you very much. I will be hanging out in Slack. If you have follow-up questions for the rest of uh, the day for the next few hours, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention and your time this morning. I hope you find it useful. Yeah. Uh -huh.